It has emerged that the Nigerian military is considering many options, including seeking external help to rescue over 300 schoolboys of government uh, science secondary school Kankara Katsina State. A top military officer confided in a rice Tisa outfit this day newspaper that one of the options being considered is for the federal government to seek assistance from the United States Africa Command, AFRICOM, to launch a rescue bid leveraging on a sophisticated technology for such operations. In the meantime, the military has dismissed claims by the Boko Haram that he masterminded Friday's abduction of the students, describing the claim of the terrorist organization made yesterday by its acclaimed leader, Waka Shekau, as mere propaganda. In a four-minute audio message that he translated in Hausa language and which has been trending on social media, Shekau claimed his members kidnapped the school board because Western education is against the tenets of Islam. In another development, Kassana State Governor Aminu Masari has said that 17 pupils of the 333 schoolboys he had earlier said could not be accounted for, has escaped from their captors. Sad times. You know, somebody was talking to me this morning and said, Rafa, is it that the media only deliberately brings bad news to Nigerians every morning? We said, no, it's a thing to happen. I know that's actually a valid question, but unfortunately it's the role of the media, as you said, to report what is happening. Yeah. And if this is what is happening, we have no option but to report it. It is really sad. It's dreadful, actually. So with regards to that plan to consult the U.S. AFRICOM, I checked the mission statement of AFRICOM, and it does look like it could work. AFRICOM is set up to counter transnational security threats, counter malign actors support security strength and security forces and restore peace and prosperity. So it looks like it could, it could be a good marriage, if I could use that term. Anything that can be thrown at this problem at this point, I fully support it. Those boys need to come home and be reunited with their families. That's really all I care about. And this news of some children going missing is just completely heartbreaking. And you, you've also said that Boko Haram has now claimed responsibility for the attack. And the military has dismissed this, saying that it's not Boko Haram and this is what they do. It is what they do. When they do attack, they claim responsibility. So I don't know what evidence the military might have to dismiss that claim for responsibility. I'd like to know. Because if you're dismissing the claim just because you don't think it's them, then that's really not good enough. I am hoping that they actually have evidence for dismissing the claim. What we do know is that there's some kind of voice message from the Shekau, claiming to be Shekau, saying that it is them, and giving their reasons that Western education is sort of an affront against Islam, which is completely, you know, demented. But this is what he has said. And it goes back to NCC and the threat to ban SIM cards who are, that are not properly registered within two weeks. How exactly is this man always so able to send these voice messages and send these videos? I mean, who registered his SIM? As in, why can't we actually trace this person? He's not a Good phantom. Good question. He's not a phantom. He's cool, sending yeah. voice notes. Good question. You know, Who it's, registered it's, a yes, Bokashi Kelsey? Yes. That's a good question. We should it's ask. Actually, an aff that is what is an affront as yeah. far as I'm concerned. He does send videos. He sends voice notes. You recall with the Zambari massacre, he sent a video. Now he's sending a voice note. And the military is just dismissing it. There's no... I want to know the evidence on which they you know, base their dismissal, because it is typical of Boko Haram to claim responsibility. It follows a pattern of behavior, unfortunately, a long pattern of behavior. They've been doing this for over 11 years at this point, approaching 12 years. So this is what they do. And he did give reasons. So I want to know what their reason is for dismissing it and saying it's just bandits. John and Nisha will be here today. So yes, I will ask. ask that question. <laughs> Dr. Wati. Well, I think what we're dealing with is the fact that government itself is confused about how to deal with the problem. It is standard uh, rhetoric on the part of government to say that Boko Haram, the terrorists, yes, they are doing propaganda, they want to instill fear, uh, they want to be noticed, uh, they are, you know, uh, just looking for publicity. And somewhere down the line, you mark it, the media is going to get blamed for giving publicity to Boko Haram. But Boko Haram uh, has now come forward to say they are behind the abduction of these hundreds of students. 839, the population of the school, a government secondary science, uh, say a science secondary school uh, in uh, Katanka, uh, you know, um, in, uh, in Katsina State. And now you have a situation whereby government is, uh, Boko Haram is saying we are responsible, and government is saying this is propaganda. 
you will recall that this week we were told both by the military and the Casina state government that they were already negotiating with the abductors. Who are they negotiating with? Good question. So they need to make that very clear. If Boko Haram says oh, we are... they can't make it clear for security reasons. No, 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 which security reasons. <laughs> yeah. If they say we are negotiating, okay, is it possible that they are negotiating with Boko Haram and they do not know? Mm. Because the governor came out, the military also said, oh, the governor is already trying to solve the problem. There's some negotiation going on. What this tells us, the response from government, what it tells us is that, look, there's confusion. Government is confused. They don't even know who they are negotiating with. They are saying one thing. Uh, Boko Haram is saying uh, another thing. But it all underlines the seriousness of the situation. In the meantime, the families, the parents, the guardians of those children who have been abducted, they are in serious anguish. We seem to be facing a Chibok-like situation. And you cannot blame those Nigerians who are saying that before now, what we had was bring back our girls. Now we are faced with hashtag bring back our boys. Whatever they say, whatever rhetoric government puts forward, I think everybody should just focus on that important task of bringing back the boys. That's the kind of information we like to hear. The governor of Casino State, State says 17 of the boys have been able to uh, escape. Now, these 17 boys, out of the 333 that the governor said are still in the custody of the uh, kidnappers, of the uh, terrorists, you know, escaped on their own, I guess. They were not helped by the police. They were not helped by the military. Uh, the, uh, the location that uh, they, they tried to identify and the exchange of gunfire is not what has led to this escape. We probably need more information in terms, five days after, of what this identification of the location, what it has brought in terms of uh, the effort of the security agencies. Yes, AFRICOM is good uh, to uh, seek help. Terrorism being a global challenge. And of course, in this particular case, the United Nations has also intervened to say that the Nigerian government has an urgent responsibility to ensure that those uh, abducted children are rescued. And you can imagine, you, you can just assume that if Nigeria seeks help, it will get that help. But the commander of the AFRICOM, you will recall, before now, uh, made some statements about the security situation uh, within the uh, Gulf of Guinea. Uh, and, and he made the point that, look, we are willing, the United States is willing to assist Nigeria, but that the Nigerian government itself should show leadership. I don't immediately recall the name of that commander, but... He occupies, he occupies that position. Now, is the Nigerian government showing the necessary leadership to be able to get the support, the help, the assistance that we are asking for from Africa? How are we showing leadership if we don't even know the exact number of uh, children who have been rescued? Ten. Well, no, what, ten, do, ten was what do you mean ten? Just ten children. No, the governor missing. says 333 are missing. And now the governor has has uh, re removed 17 from the 333. Yeah, so problem of no, communication. No, but I said the presidential spokesperson said 10. But the governor says 333 minus 17 can, can you see is the exact number point? now. So who will help you if you are not showing the necessary leadership? Who will help you if you are not even sure whether you are dealing with a group of motorcycle riding, AK-47 uh, wielding bandits, you know, uh, bandits on foot, or you are dealing with a group of uh, terrorists who are linked to, you know, international, uh, the international terrorism network. So the Nigerian government needs to show a lot more seriousness in this matter. That's how we can get the right kind of help. Otherwise, they will think that, you know, Nigeria is not serious and that the leaders don't even understand what is going on. Asorok is saying one thing. Uh, Masari's uh, gov uh, uh, government is saying another thing. The military is talking from another side of the, of the mouth. And that's why you can't blame Nigerians who say they are looking at this government from a corner of their eyes. However, I think it's a good development that some states have decided to close down schools. Uh, Jigawa, Zamfara, add to that uh, Kaduna. And then add to that also, before now, Ebony State in the south where Dave Umayi said, look, it's important for everybody to apply wisdom 
And as part of applying wisdom, he said he will close down the schools. In his own case, it's about uh, COVID-19, right? But maybe security considerations are also involved. I don't know if said it's COVID-19 uh -huh. as well. Not yes. Security. So, but people are saying that, okay, COVID and uh, security, all of these challenges, maybe it's wise to just close down the schools and observe what is going on. Because it looks like the nation, Nigeria, is under siege. And everything seems to be conspiring against us. And we have security agencies who are not living up to the billing. And we just hope that there will be better synergy, that there will be better coordination, and that we'll not be having conflicting uh, statements uh, coming from either the center or from the subnational entities. This is where we are. However, the schools that say, the states that say that they are closing the schools uh, because of COVID, in any case, all the schools will have shut down this week because yeah. the schools will go for That's Christmas good. holiday. Mm. So I hope it's not an opportunistic, exploitative, mm. you know, uh, uh, thing that those states are doing just mm. to grandstand. Virtuous signal. Yeah, because in any case, schools will shut down. All right. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Batiantino, for that in-depth uh, analysis there. I mean, you, you, you can see the confusion. Uh, Presidency 10, Dr. Bati. Governor 333. Minus 17. Minus 17. Just and, like and we had with the, I hate to say. Just like we had with the farmers too. Yes, but UN I hate to say there was an account of one of the boys who escaped that said two boys were killed in his presence. So that, that just really is worrying. Right. Uh, let's say a prayer for our country. That's all on news headlines. Take a short break now. When we return, we have uh, Rod Sudiri, Michael Wilson, Adiswa Morwa, Erin Akirjola, and the team to give us updates on Africa, global business, COVID-19, and sporting activities. Stay with us. For Everything Business, welcome back to the Morning Show, right here on the Rise News Channel. And for Everything Business, as always, we've got Rotus. It's your business, Rotus. Good morning. Good morning, uh, Rufai. Good morning, Tundu. Good morning. Yeah. Doc morning. Doctor, good to see you again. Welcome back. Yes, um, yes, yes. So we begin with the uh, you, Nigerian... Rotus, <laughs> Afolabi, Udiri. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> you have to claim that name. <laughs> I've claimed it. I've completely claimed it, Doctor. <laughs> so we start with the uh, Nigerian Communications Commission. Um, they've given the telcos uh, two weeks uh, to register uh, SIMs um, with the NIN, NIN number. And if they don't have it, they're going to be blocked. Here's a statement very quickly. Following the earlier directive of the suspension of the new SIM registration by network operators, the Honorable Minister of Communications and Digital Economy, Dr. Issa Ibrahim Pantami, convened a meeting with key stakeholders. Just pretty much jump to the third paragraph. At the meeting, the need to consolidate the achievements of the last year's SIM registration audits and improve the performance and sanity of the sector was exhaustively discussed, and all stakeholders agreed that urgent drastic measures have now become inevitable to improve the integrity and transparency of the SIM registration process. I jumped to the third paragraph. Look at the second half of the um, statement, and the, here's what they decided to come up with. If we look at the second statement, um, the here, okay, so essentially, one, affirmation of the earlier directive to totally suspend registration of new SIMs. We talked about that on the 10th of this month, just about six days ago. Secondly, operators are required to all require all their subscribers to provide valid national identification numbers to update their SIM registration. So they're tying them together. This is the key here. They're tying the national identification number to SIM registration. Submission of the SIM, that's point number three, submission of the NIM by subscribers to take place within two weeks from today, December the 16th, as we speak, up until the end of December. After the deadline, all SIMs without the national identification number are to be blocked from the networks. Uh, then the ministerial task force comprising of the minister and all the CEOs who were convened with him when they had this stakeholder meeting and members are to monitor compliance by all networks. And then if there are any violations, there will be stiff sanctions, even including the possibility of withdrawal of the operating license signed by Dr. Ikechuko Adinde, Director of Public Affairs. Then Bashir Ahmed, personal assistant to the uh, president of New Media, sent out a tweet essentially reiterating uh, the same thing, having two weeks and then, but, but let's look at the reactions. The reactions weren't, people aren't taking this very well. So 
um, individual says, I don't think it's very interesting. I've, I hardly see Bashir Ahmed reply people on Twitter, so this was this was rare. But an individual says, I don't think 70% of Nigerians have a national identification number. Bashir then says, We should all get them, it's very important. Next individual says, You guys live in a bubble, and it's most times really frustrating to note what has government done to ease the path towards mass acquisition of the NIN? What's the mass awareness and sensitization plan after uh, five years? And then uh, the gentleman at the bottom says, Doesn't have a response and all they do is cause, cause uh, hardship. So the, the th thing here is that I will say, though, in favor of the government, they are. if you go to the, um, the website for the NIMC, um, you will see a map of Nigeria with all the states. You can click on the states, and then they will essentially tell you where all the registration centers for the national identification number are. And they are in different local government areas. Even the banks are assisting them in getting people registered. But the issue, though, is, and I believe that you can get registered relatively uh, quickly. Um, the thing is that there's just too many data points as far as the identification is concerned. You've got the BVN, you've got the NIN, you've got your driver's license, you've got your voter's card, you've got, you know, passport. We, there just needs to be one number that Nigerians use to identify themselves when it comes to this, this method of identification. Two weeks, yeah, we are in the middle of, I believe, a second wave. Uh, this will come and talk to us about uh, COVID-19 cases. I think we recorded about 785 or 86 yesterday. Those numbers are rising. You're going to get people to now start rushing to NIN centers to go and get registered. How do you make sure that this process is smooth over the next uh, uh, two weeks? And it's two weeks enough time uh, to do this. So that's the main uh, issue here is that it seems they're making things pretty difficult for people. Um, think about people who fly into the country on business who aren't registered here. All, all those complications with regards to um, this registration. Looking, this, looking forward to hear your thoughts. Also on inflation, very quickly, uh, inflation figures came out uh, yesterday. Headline inflation... Uh, uh, jump by 66 basis points to 14.89%. Uh, percent. That's headline inflation. Um, food inflation was the main driver of the continued rise that we're seeing uh, with respect to inflation. That jumped to 18.3%. Uh, I think it was 17.3 or so. I think it was a 92 basis point jump for food. So again, um, you are seeing pressure on investment returns as far as the inflation is concerned because your real rate of return continues to reduce. It's a low uh, rate environment. And wages in Nigeria Nigeria are not rising to match inflation. Wages in Nigeria have been pretty sticky, so purchasing power continues to be squeezed. But the three main issues that we've seen in inflation, one, a modest at best harvest period, two, insecurity uh, on the farms. You, you know, we're talking about the bring back our boys, the farmers that have been killed by terrorists, and then three, the border closure. Those three um, touch points continue to weigh heavily on inflation figures uh, in the country. All right, Rotos, I just quickly want to comment on that NI thing. Because I've been through the process. Recently, I had to go change the arrangement of my name. And you need to, to see the scam and corruption that goes on there. At first, they say you should go pay a remitter. And uh, when you pay that remitter, they make life very difficult for you in such a way that they tell you, okay, oh, God, we can do it for you. You pay 10000 and this goes on. And it's, it, the, the logistic is a nightmare. And like you stated rightly, uh, I, I want to wonder, that was that the best thought out of the room when the CEOs were there, or those in authority said the CEO shouldn't talk? Because I, I, I believe the CEOs that we have in the Nigerian tech scene will have brought out a better suggestion. There's something called machine learning. The minister knows this. Let the computers handshake all the data points. It's as simple as that. And I don't know why we perpetually make life very difficult for one another in this country. The BVN is there. Right. The driver's license is there. The NIN is connected to your national passport already because if you don't have NIN number, you can't renew your Nigerian passport. Mm. So all those data points, why don't you just make them shake hands? You are giving a two-week a two -week window for this where a lot of people have not been able to get their NIN. Have you tried going to do the NIN? I think we should take a reporter to try to go do investigative journalism on getting an NIN registry. And you see how difficult it is in this country. The corruption that goes on there, that these officials have started. And I don't know. Well, why that wasn't we... my experience, to be fair. Yeah, well, I did get fair, my NIN yeah, exactly, number refined. a few years ago, and that was, I did not have the experience. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Maybe you did not have the experience, but now the experience is different. The right. way it goes out for people, the government should just do a handshake. They have all these data points. Your right. PVC data is there. All this, they've captured you. Just okay. do a quick handshake. I would now, like to make a number of points. One, uh, Dr. Pantami. Yes. He's regarded as one of the uh, very qualified persons 
appointed by uh, President Muhammad Buhari. Um, and you know, he's promoted as uh, a very well-educated, knowledgeable man. But I mean, I, I'm shocked, you know, at the kind of policies that have been coming from that ministry in the uh, last uh, few weeks. First was that uh, policy saying that, uh, um, you know, the network should stop the sale of uh, SIM cards. SIM cards right. And we had questioned that, that it didn't make sense, and that the, uh, NC, uh, the Ministry of uh, Communications and Digital Technology, represented by its agency, the NCC, was sounding like a fascist unit of government, you know, uh, derogating the uh, rights of persons uh, to communicate, to express themselves, and also, you know, uh, stifling the rights of uh, businesses uh, to be able to do what they should do to add value. And that in any case, that threat about withdrawing licenses uh, looked like blackmail. And that the deadline that that ministry was uh, given through NCC did not make sense. Now, if you thought that was uh, you know, a fascist move, what they have now come up with is completely senseless. Really? Yes. And I'm surprised that uh, you know, a man, a highly regarded person uh, like Pantami, signed off on that kind of uh, you know, uh, unreasonable uh, you know, policy that has now been uh, pushed out about NIN, national identification number, being linked to, the SIM, uh, to your SIM card registration, and then two weeks. This is fascism, simplicity. Mm. Now, I like the point made by Rufai that, okay, the CEOs of the networks, when they went to the meetings, right. did they go there with uh, their lips uh, you know, tied up? Right. Uh, because the statement that you uh, read out said, oh, they agreed that it was, uh, you know, uh, it was a good way to go. Well, maybe the networks uh, sent, uh, you know, their yes men to the place and they left their brains in the office uh, when they went to the meeting. If they didn't, if they went there with their brains, we would like to hear from them because it should not be, uh, you know, ordinary citizens, consumers defending their own interests or the practicability Right. of their own uh, operations. It's not enough to just wear a tie, you put on a tie and go to a meeting and go there and behave like uh, you are in face of, uh, uh, in the presence of uh, some kind of uh, fascist. Now, so this is the, uh, the issue for me, mm. and I think that we need to interrogate that further. Now, in the best of times, the NIMC, which is responsible for the uh, NIN, has not been able to even capture enough Nigerians. It's, it's, for many Nigerians, yes, Tundun, your experience may have been different, and uh, I don't know whether you facilitated it. No, I because, did not. Because when you facilitate it, in most of the places, you end, up like getting, you end up getting that uh, piece of paper. No, yes, I did not. Where the experience of many Nigerians is that they, they gain access, they have a number just because they have facilitated it. And then it takes forever for you to even get a proper uh, card. Right. Uh, so the NIMC itself, were they part of this conversation? Are they prepared to deal with the registration of persons who will become desperate and will say, I don't want to lose my SIM card? Right. right. I don't think that NIMSI has that capacity, even with the fact that they have units in local government uh, uh, centers. In the best of times, uh, they've not been very efficient. They have their own issues. Now, if you say two weeks, has anybody thought of the fact that we are in a COVID-19 season? At a time, the federal government, uh, the Africa Centers for Disease Control are talking about a second wave. And if you look at the Spanish flu, 1918, the, more people died during the second wave. Yes. And this is the time that we need to be more careful. And then you want to create a national rush of people going about looking for, uh, uh, for numbers. So I would like to suggest uh, that, look, uh, Dr. Pantami and his team, they should take a second look at this. It does not make sense. There is a pushback. And the point about, uh, what did you call it now? Shaking of hands. Yes. Yeah, coordination. But we don't have that coordination. We don't have that synergy. We don't have, you know, that kind of uh, interface right. among government agencies. Even to get a passport, to have a passport, to have the primary number, mm. is a nightmare. Right. They are always saying that uh, they don't have, uh, uh, you booklets. know, they don't have booklets. <laughs> the booklets are never available. <laughs> And yet, you are saying, okay, uh, NIMC should give people numbers, SIM cards should be, uh, be cancelled if they are not available. If they cancel anybody's uh, SIM card, uh, 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 people go to uh, court. Line. 
that person should go to court. Should go to court. So it should be a violation yes. of our fundamental rights as Nigerians to, make... to express ourselves, to talk to other people. And we like to talk. In fact, <laughs> if they, in the face of COVID or whatever uh, inflation going up, whatever goes up, whatever goes down, Nigerians like to connect and express themselves. And in fact, the access to a telephone has been one of the positives of COVID-19. Because you don't need to go and mix with people. You can just sit in your house and talk for as long as you, you want. Right. Now they want to take that right away from Nigerians. Well, we don't... It is senseless, it is unacceptable, and I think it should be reviewed. We can't talk for as long as we want because Mr. Wilson is waiting in the wings. So I want to say <laughs> that when I went and got my NIN, the issue I would like to raise, mine was quite a painless process. It was easier for me than renewing my passport, actually. But the issue I want to raise is that the room was so small, airless, and cramped, and there were queues going outside, sort of snaking outside. People will not observe social distancing in the queues and in the rooms. That's just a petri dish of COVID-19. So I, ha I really have to stress, they must review this two-week window. It's actually unfair. Well, Tundo, I, I want to say that I'm absolutely sure that you went to uh, the NIMC office in Ikoyi or Victoria Island. That's not the experience of those of us in Agege and yeah. uh, Okokomai. Yeah. Maybe we went to the uh, NIMC uh, special <laughs> center. <laughs> special center. Uh, I would like to invite you to visit no, the one no in Agege or the one no in uh, Abule Egba. No uh, first then, Agamu World of Then you can have a no, more. You have a more, more. I thought they were great and I had a really uh, In Ikoyi and Bia. Yes, maybe. Special center. Then come to Abule Egba. All right, right, moving on to business of the market. We'll see you for a moment. Thank you, by the way, Rutus. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, Michael. Good morning. Uh, good morning. Um, uh, I'll take you through the Asian markets as I normally do, but globally, the, the, the idea of some kind of fiscal stimulus hopes were raised uh, in the United States last night. So we'll wait to see about that. Um, so it made it allowed the U.S. indices to shrug off their major losses. Asian markets have not really followed suit, a bit mixed, but um, Australia particularly outperforming given um, rise in commodity prices, Hong Kong up a little bit, uh, and no sign of uh, China import ban fears in Australia, so that's helping them. Let me take you back to the United States. Equity markets shrugged off that previous uh, run of losses I was talking about. There's rising hopes the package could be worth of the stimulus plan in the United States at last. It could be worth $750 billion. It's a long, long long way away from the two trillion that was originally talked about but um maybe 1.4 i mean who knows these figures are being banded about at the moment and of course we've got the fomc meeting uh, tonight and reports on that tomorrow so we'll come on to that um lawmakers they may have been given another nudge by the fact that the new york empire state manufacturing index and also uk uh, us rather industrial production was rather disappointing yesterday and if you remember last week got those rather disappointing pointing jobless figures in the United States. So it may be that COVID's rampage through the United States will force lawmakers to at last Ask, get some action together about that stimulus plan. The markets also received a nice boost. Another vaccine from the from the US FDA, Moderna's COVID-19 vaccine, appeared highly effective. That clears the way for an emergency clearance by the FDA in the United States. That could happen by as quickly as Friday, I'm being told. Apple shares up 4% on the Japanese news. Uh, this is from Nikkei. This is the publishers of the Financial Times, of course, that iPhone production would rise up by 30% in 2021 to build up to 96 million iPhones between January and June. Uh, that's, you know, this, this, that includes iPhone 12, iPhone 11, and the iPhone SE, if you are one of these sort of adapters, adopters, rather, that has to change every couple of minutes to a new phone. You'll love that. If you're like me, you carry on with the old one. But there we are. Um, IPO, still this amazing appetite for IPOs now. This is Wish, the e-commerce site. Um, it raised $1.4 billion at its IPO. It means it's now worth an incredible four. $14 billion. They were looking for a share price of about $24. We don't know if they got that because nobody's saying anything about it, but it worked quite well. In the UK, Brexit, those discussions continue, helps rise a little. You were talking about queues and mixing together and so on. We're wondering whether or not we're going to be allowed to mix at Christmas, the Christmas bubble of a few days. I suspect, I mean, I don't like to be too rude about this, but I would imagine that after a few, a few drinks, the idea 
idea of keeping apart from people and not talking to them may disappear, but who knows? I think we'll probably see another spike. Um, just in terms of these trade negotiations, we got a glimpse of what an independent away from the EU, EU uh, UK might look like. There is a, 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 a suggestion, and this has been completely denied by the industry and government, but it's quite useful to reform the tonnage tax. Now, this is very boring, isn't it? But this is why companies, uh, countries like Singapore do quite well out of shipping. It could This, this could be worth about four billion pounds to the economy, could create two and a half thousand jobs, another 25,000 in relation industries to try to, um, as it were, resurrect the merchant navy uh, in the UK. That could be, uh, that's a nice in ex example of how the UK might be heading towards independence from the EU. Uh, Facebook will shift its UK users onto agreements in the United States. Um, this move will put UK uh, out, of, um, out of reach of Europe's privacy laws. Currently, UK um, Users are governed by Facebook's Irish headquarters, uh, and that will move something. Whether or not this actually uh, will help or hinder one's privacy, not quite sure. But do remember that Amazon, Apple, Facebook and Google, have, as I told you yesterday, face fines of up to 10% of annual turnover if they don't protect their customers, and in particular children, from uh, nasty content uh, online. Down to parents too, I would suggest. Um, EU, December, a bleak story really for Germany and France but they've given up in Germany there's, there's going to be a lockdown there no question about that uh, over Christmas in France it's been a similar kind of um, picture with their services industries doing very very badly indeed restaurants bars closing and so on it means December is likely to see the fourth consecutive month of contraction in the major economies uh, in the EU and there'll be no pickup in economic activity for quite some time however only manufacturing and, well, manufacturing doing quite well in Germany and France, but that's still a very mixed picture. Commodities, oil shrugs off its downgrades. Um, IEA joined OPEC in downgrading what they think uh, the next year's consumption will be, but, uh, you know, it actually, um, it, it's, it, it, it's, it's a difficult one to predict this, but we're looking, you'll be very pleased about this, WTI rising to $47.5 a barrel overnight. Um, FO, FOMC, uh, expectations could propel gold higher if they um if they cap the rise in long-term U.S. interest rates because people want long-term security. And day ahead, I push you towards, um, we're going to get the Bank of England tomorrow, but retail sales in November in the United States and some flash PMIs as well. D that will depend really on, that'll give us a nice picture, I suppose, of where the U.S. economy actually has been heading. I suspect it'll be fairly disappointing as that country it languishes in its lockdown as we approach Christmas, probably the same here too. That's your global view. Uh, thank you so much for that, M Michael. I, I just want to know where the talks are now, because, I mean, we've said a lot about these talks. Uh, we all know uh, these were the same talks that were, were over-ready deals at a point in time, and now it's just a couple of days away. 31st, 30th, you crash out of the EU, and that reality is staring at the UK in the face. Where are the talks now? Hustler is not saying anything. Van der Leyen is not saying anything. Nobody's saying anything. It's all hush-hush now. Uh, I, I'm pleased nobody's saying anything because it gives people like me an opportunity to relax slightly because all we're getting is noise. There's very little news. What I can tell you is it's likely, as I understand this morning, just hearing it, that there will be some parliamentary debate about this. The session has been set aside next week. So I think there are undercurrents of something actually approaching uh, a, a deal. It, it may well be. I, I still feel optimistic that a deal will be done. I'm not necessarily optimistic about the terms that will apply to that deal. But I do look forward to lots of trade deals in 2021, which we will pursue bilaterally, I feel, away from away from the EU. Very, very difficult to predict at the moment. The noises are warm, is all I can tell you. Well, uh, Michael, I mean, two quick things. The Prime Minister, Boris Johnson, says it is too late to cancel uh, Christmas. Uh, but what's your own opinion? Because there's a pressure. Uh, there's this growing pressure on the government that uh, the United Kingdom should try and cancel Christmas, as it were. I know you referred to it uh, earlier, but really, what is the mood within the community? And then unemployment in the UK, 4.9% reported uh, within the uh, last three months, uh, the highest since uh, 2016. 
if you could also comment a little on that and the efforts of government uh, to address it. Okay, so as far as my neighbours here are concerned, they're going to be responsible, but they may well have small gatherings for Christmas. And I think most people would actually quite enjoy that. You were talking yourself earlier, Doctor, about the importance of talking to people. We all enjoy doing that. We're all garrulous kind of people, aren't we? We like to get together and so on. I think cancelling Christmas is probably putting it a bit far. I think if people res behave responsibly, then there won't be a third spike. But I don't think people will behave responsibly. I think they'll have a few drinks and have a good time. And I suspect that we may be talking, if I hope we are in a couple of weeks, about, um, I hope we will be talking in a couple of weeks, but I hope the subject won't be a third spot. I suspect it probably will. I think that we're facing that. As far as unemployment concer is concerned, um, hospitality industries in particular have lost about 300,000 in our country, which is a, a lot of people. 800,000 people have lost their jobs since the beginning of the pandemic. The unemployment rate is clearly too high. Is there a lot of money into consumer spending? Would it come back in 2021? Let's hope so. I, 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 there is no answer to your question, just the hope that 2021 will be slightly better. Long-term horizon, maybe vaccines will be delivered as well. In, in, let's hope it's not as horrible a year as 2020 has been. Optimism is, is a very powerful weapon, I think, in these markets. Well, thank you. All right, thank you so much for that, Michael. Really appreciate you for your time. Uh, for COVID-19 pandemic update, I just want Morowa is here. I just want great to have you. About it. Good to have you back. I hope you did not jump the queue to sneak to go get a vaccine jab somewhere. <laughs> well, don't be surprised, but we'll come to that. I'd like to comment on that. <laughs> okay, all right. Let's begin with the global numbers. Uh, we'll bring, I know a lot of people might not fancy these numbers every day, but we'll bring it to you because just because you have not been infected doesn't mean people are not getting infected somewhere else, uh, or even close to you, closer than you think. Uh, let's look at the daily numbers. Yesterday, according to the John, Johns Hopkins University, there you have it, the yellow graph there. Uh, we've recorded 536,000 just yesterday. We've come a long way from the beginning of this pandemic. If you follow it, you see the peak is dropping, and we hope that it continues to drop. But at the moment, we are averaging 500,000 daily. We also see the death graph, which is the white one. Uh, you see that it peaked yesterday, unfortunately. And when you now look at the global tally uh, so far, uh, we have 73.4 million cases and 1.6 million deaths. Let's quickly go to Europe, where after days of pressuring the EU's medical regulator uh, in the region, the German health minister Jan Schifan, he's saying that the EMA, which is the European Medicines Agency, will approve a corona vaccine before Christmas. Germany and European Union nations had expressed frustration over the EU's delay in approving the Pfizer-BioNTech vaccine. And one can only understand their frustration, considering that this vaccine was actually developed by a German company alongside a, an American drug maker, Pfizer, which is already being used in Britain, the US, Canada, and some other countries have given a green light. So you wonder why there's this delay. But the EMA has now moved up a meeting to assess the vaccine on December 21st. Uh, they're likely to fast track that and of course inoculation with them begin. DMA evaluates drugs and vaccines for the European Union uh, 27 nations. So they are saying they want to weigh the benefits and the risk and make sure that they are doing the right thing. Away from there to the US where federal regulators issued a positive review of another vaccine for the US and that's the Moderna vaccine. Uh, they are saying that uh, preliminary analysis confirmed the effectiveness and safety of the vaccine. Um, a 54-page document they released yesterday said that the vaccine is 94.1% uh, um, effective. Out of the 30,000 people it was used on during trials, the Moderna vaccine we know is easier to store and of course uh, it will be easier to transport, the logistics will be better, keeping it safe because you can use regular refrigerators. Also in the US, uh, before then, the 54 page document also showed that the common side effects with the Moderna vaccine included fever, headaches, 
muscle and joint pains. So people already understand that they'll be getting the side effects uh, when they take it. Meanwhile, Dr. Fauci is recommending that those that are very important to the country right now, such as President Trump, Vice President Pre uh, Pence, um, incoming president, President-elect Joe Biden, and his vice, Kamala Harris, should get their jabs. By the way, Dr. Fauci, who is the director of the National Institute of Allergy and Infection Diseases, is yet to get a jab himself. We talked about the Pfizer CEO yesterday also not getting his own jab uh, yet. He says he does not want to jump the queue. Uh, but President Trump is saying that he's open to taking the jab, but he will wait for his medical team to tell him when to go ahead with the jab. Joe Biden and Kamala Harris will hear their team will also uh, release dates for when they should take the jab. They, uh, President Trump and uh, President-elect Biden are, you know, old considering their age, so they are at risk. President Trump, we know, has been infected before, so he has antibodies, but we don't know how long it will last. Uh, let's we'll come to Nigeria, where the country, Rotus mentioned this yesterday, and we all know we are seeing the rise in cases. Yesterday, we recorded 758 cases in 24 hours. Uh, that brings the total of the country at the moment to 74,132. Um, but what we are also seeing is that some, some states are becoming proactive, such as Kaduna State. Uh, the Kaduna State government yesterday shut all schools indefinitely, starting from today. They say they are seeing a rise in cases, especially in those aged between 10 and 35. Uh, Jigawa also shut schools. It is unclear if that was as a result of COVID-19 or because of the security threat in the region, uh, Jigawa borders Katsina, where school, school children were abducted last week. So that is ongoing. And um, also yesterday, there's controversy, guys, over the health status of the Chief Justice of Nigeria, uh, Tanko Mohammed. The CGN has been conspicuously absent from the public. And um, Yesterday, one of the newly promoted justices to the bench of the Apex Courts, uh, Justice Salawa Ibrahim, that's his name, at, uh, a pre at an event in Abuja, uh, said that the CGN has been infected with COVID-19 and is receiving treatment in a hospital in Dubai. Um, a lot of press outlets ran with that and, you know, published. Uh, but a few hours later, we saw the... Um, spokesperson for the Supreme Court, uh, Festus Akonde, that's his name, he released a statement and debunked that and said there is no evidence that the CGN is COVID positive or is receiving treatment for COVID. But the question is, where is the CJN? Why is he absent from public? And if he's ill, why is this such a controversy? Mm. Mm. I, I don't even know where to begin with that <laughs> snitch case. The little blabber mouth incident. And I just want to talk about the lack of transparency that we get. That where is the CJN reminded me of when we were all asking where's the president. There's no need to be so, you know, well, this is not discreet, I guess, secretive about the health of our public officials. The, the nation, the public, we deserve to know. We have a right to know. So I do hope that some you know, light is shed on that, exactly what the status of his health is, where he is, whether or not he is receiving treatment. And that indiscreet judge, I would not want to be in that person's shoes at the <laughs> moment. I'm sure they're in big trouble. Great. Now, the Moderna vaccine, that they saw, I wanted to ask you, mm -hmm. they didn't you know, conduct trials for people under the age of 18, so it's not going to be available for children. And they also did not conduct trials for pregnant women. Yes. What pregnant woman would go and get jabbed? Mm. at all, even if there were extensive trials. I just even wonder what that really means. But with Moderna, there's a more optimism, well, for me personally, than for the Pfizer vaccine, which we've all discussed here. We just simply do not have the sort of logistics yeah. to effectively distribute that. But So we're looking at Moderna. Well, to add to uh, the Moderna uh, story, uh, Pfizer and Moderna incidentally use the same kind of technology. Yeah. And what we've been told is that, uh, you know, you can't take the same uh, vaccines because they follow the same pattern. You take two doses, you know, and then within 14 days, uh, it kicks into uh, uh, effect. But the interesting thing is that we keep getting these positive rep reports that indicate hope. Mm -hmm. uh, Pfizer, uh, Moderna, AstraZeneca, you know, and all the uh, candidates that have gone beyond the uh, phase three uh, trials mm -hmm. and we're hoping that the uh, Moderna vaccine, of course, we get emergency authorization also 
as is the case with others by next week. But what is important is for people to uh, note, as scientists point out, that you can combine the doses, you can. whether it's uh, Pfizer and Moderna, because mm -hmm. people can be very creative. But to your question, that you started with whether I sneaked away to get, go and get a job. Mm -hmm. I think, look, we should continue to raise the question, what exactly is Nigeria's strategy for getting these vaccines? We're the most populous country in Africa. If there is a proper audit, a proper curation of the uh, situation, we'll probably have more cases than we are reporting. Mm -hmm. And at the end of the day, what is likely to happen is that many of these uh, private uh, health uh, organizations, they will find a way to go and get some of these vaccines that are already being administered. Don't forget that the pharmaceutical companies, the big pharma, they are into this thing for business. Before you know it now, our people will find a way, they will get the uh, vaccine into Nigeria ahead of time, and the only people who will have access to it will be people who can afford it. Yes. That's rich dangerous. people, because That's they will, it, it, it will become big business. Mm -hmm. Look, when this uh, COVID-19 started, the sale of uh, face mask was very big business. Some people became billionaires for selling uh, face mask. If sanitizers. You, it, our, our sanitizer. Mm -hmm. If you went into a pharmaceutical mm -hmm. shop, you know they will tell you that a small pack of uh, of uh, 50 units of uh, face mask was 50,000. Mm -hmm. Yes. Today, that same uh, 50,000 pack, you can get it for less than uh, uh, 1,000 naira on the streets of Nigeria. But some people brought it in, they imported it. You are going to see desperate importation of vaccines, either by private persons who have access or by private medical organizations. And it's only the rich that we have access to it because they can afford uh, to get it. And that will leave all of us, ordinary Nigerians, in a very sorry situation. And that is why government needs a strategy, because when you talk about global uh, solidarity, you talk about the moral dimension of it. The moral dimension of it is making sure that people have equal access and opportunity to get the vaccine. And very now, quickly. another thing we need to worry about mm -hmm. in Nigeria, you know, Interpol talked about fake vaccines, the black a syndicate that. that had already emerged. Mm -hmm. Now, Nigeria is likely to be a favorite destination for fake COVID uh, vaccines. Yes. Before you know it now, some of our very resourceful and enterprising, in quotes, uh, you know, brothers and sisters, they will be heading towards Asia and some other places. They will manufacture their own vaccines. Do we have a structure in place mm. in Nigeria? But well, the check point that. that I was making about logistics with the Pfizer vaccine, no matter how yes. rich you are or whatever mm. the case may be, Money does, you know, sort of protect you and insulate you from a lot of the world's ills, but mm -hmm. you can never be rich enough to surmount certain obstacles, such as this Pfizer vaccine. Mm -hmm. If your country does not have the required storage, yes. then you're going to poison yourself effectively. Mm -hmm. So I really do think that vaccines like Moderna is what the Nigerian government should be looking at. That Pfizer vaccine, imagine it, even if there's all the dry ice possible mm -hmm. and it maintains its integrity mm -hmm. when it's brought into Nigeria, by the time it moves from the port or the airport we to sort of rural cannot. areas, you can imagine what's going to happen. We don't have I mean, the good, good point, mate. I still want to talk about logistics. Please, let's all go out there and count. How many primary health care centers mm. are from here in Ikoi to Ekwe? I'm not sure they're up to five. Mm. What is going to be the method of distribution? Even if we want to say we want to go by primary health care centers, yes. do we have enough functioning primary health care centers? I, you can quote me if I'm wrong. From here in Ikoi to Ekwe, I'm not sure we have up to 10 primary health care centers. I'm not and sure they're up to three. Up to three. And look at how many people on this axis. So we should look at the case of infrastructure too. And I thought COVID-19 was going to help us build that infrastructure. I thought we were going to build primary health care centers with those money we have wish we used in building isolation camps. But it's shocking that we have not fixed. So even if the vaccine comes to the... Are we going to have a vaccination program like we have for polio, mm. where people go from house to house, or... We have a primary health care center where people come. So I don't know how it's going well, to work. Well, distribution, logistics, that's yeah. at the end of it. You have to get it first. First. What is the strategy you know, for... No, but you need for... to prepare before it comes in. Yeah. Yes, it that's, what, in, other com that's what other countries do. But there must be an awareness. There must be a determination to get the vaccine first. The only thing we are hearing from the authorities in Nigeria is that we are relying on, on the COVAX alliance, on charity. 
Now, if you are relying on charity, you probably will not plan ahead because yeah. it shows clearly that you are probably not thinking ahead. Mm -hmm. That's where the challenge lies. As to uh, the uh, fear about you know, the uh, desirability of one vaccine against the other, I think Anthony Fauci said to that matter a week ago that the advantage we have is that there are options. Yes. Apart from the ones that are already uh, being administered or that have gone through emergency authorization, there are still over 100 uh, vaccine candidates being tested. So at the end of the day, the science will advance and each country will make the best option uh, that will serve the interest of its people. But what we need to hear from the Nigerian government is a thinking ahead strategy, you know, to see that uh, we're more, uh, the people are very important. Otherwise, those private medical uh, organizations, they will find a way of assessing these vaccines. They will provide the necessary refrigeration process and they will sell at a premium and the ordinary people of Nigeria will be shut out. Now there's talk about going into the excess crude account to get so, you know, is that money yeah. Are you sure there is money in is the excess money? crude account? That's, that's why I'm smiling and saying that there's talk I about I think that the, the only consolation that uh, Nigerians and others in low and me, um, poor middle income countries will get is that until we vaccinate majority of the population globally, no one is safe. So whatever governments are doing, they have to get their acts together because we need people to be vaccinated or else we're not going anywhere. Okay. I guess why you cannot be more correct. Thank you so much. <laughs> really appreciate you for that. Let's all take this seriously. COVID is real and it kills.